decided to make it available to Ravitch alums and other interested parties wherever you may be. Um, the current crop of 20 people is here. You might see them pop into the camera from time to time. Um, those of you who would like the PowerPoint can email me and I will email you the PowerPoint. Also, if you have questions during the course of this you would like asked, you can email them to me. And now I'm going to turn it over to Lucy Dadian from the Rockefeller Institute. Today we're going to do the context for the fiscal implications of sports gambling and cannabis. Tomorrow we're going to go in-depth on sports gambling, what to watch for in legalization, players, how to follow the money, and we're going to do the same thing on Thursday on cannabis. Lucy, take it away. Thank you, Craig, for the introduction. Just one little correction from Urban Institute, not the Rockefeller Institute. Okay. Oh, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I used to be with the Rockefeller Institute of Government. Now I am with the Tax Policy Center at the Urban Institute. So, um, for some reason, I became an expert on sin taxes, and that was all started in the during the Great Recession when many states were turning into legalization of casinos and casinos. And I did one study which um, got a lot of media attention, which followed up with subsequent studies and subse subsequent um, follow-ups on collecting data on casinos and casinos as well as on marijuana and other types of um, syntaxes. Uh, such data is not available from Census Bureau, particularly for casinos and casinos, as well as for marijuana. So that's the reason why um, our work became um, quite um, in demand. So I thought that um, in order to talk about um, um, context about uh, to give a context for sports betting and marijuana I should be talking about the old type of sin taxes that is the alcohol tobacco and gambling so I will first discuss the bottom part of the image which is the alcohol tobacco and casino the tax revenues from this type of uh, sin goods sin services and then I will um, provide the context uh, for sports betting and marijuana so there is a growing competition between different types types of scenes. Now let's start with the tobacco. The cigarette taxes were first enacted at the federal level in 1864 during the Civil War and uh, that was introduced as a revenue measure. In 1921 Iowa was the first state ever to um, introduce the state tax on cigarettes and by 1969 all 50 states were already imposing taxes on cigarettes. States levy tax not only on cigarettes, but also on other types of tobacco products. And uh, in addition to the states, local governments in six states also levy taxes on cigarettes. The, uh, as a result, there is a large tax disparities among various tobacco products among, um, again, um, as well as uh, within the states as, uh, and across the states. So the following, I forgot to move forward. The following figure shows the variation in cigarette tax rates uh, in 2017. So one of the biggest issues related to cigarette taxes is that there is large discrepancy among the states and also sometimes within the state, for example in New York City uh, versus the rest of the uh, state where the tax rates are much lower compared to the New York City because New York City levies its own tax. And this provides incentives, such discrepancy provides incentives for tax avoidance through smuggling but also through legal cross border, um, border crossing because if you are a resident of Washington DC which has a very high tax rate and if you cross to Virginia to buy cigarettes for your own consumption this is not really a smuggling but a legal uh, cross, a border crossing and um, 
tax avoidance. And also it encourages people to buy cigarettes over the internet. So as of January 2017, the cigarette excise tax rates per pack ranged from as low as 17 cents in Missouri to as high as $4.35 in New York State. You can see in the map that uh, in general states in the northeast and in the west are um, have higher tax rate, whereas the states in the south have lower tax rates. Oops, here you go. So states often raise tax rates on cigarette during tough economic times. The following figure shows the number of states that have raised cigarette tax uh, rates since 2001. So the, bar chart, the bars are the number of states um, raising the tax rates. And between 2001 and uh, 2017, in total, 48 states have raised taxes on cigarettes about 130 times. The only two states that have not raised taxes on cigarettes are Missouri and North Dakota. Um, and you can see that more states have raised taxes in response to the 2001 recession and in the aftermath of the recession compared to uh, 2008, 2007, 2008 recession, despite the fact that we saw the uh, most uh, um, severe economic recession in the modern times since the Great Recession. Now, the following chart shows the median cigarette tax rate by year since 2000. The median cigarette tax rate increased. It's in nominal terms, and you can see that it increased from 34 cents in 2000 to $1.57 in 2017. You all know what the word nominal means, right? I hope you do. <laughs> so the increase was about 360% between the 2000 and 2017. And the following figure shows the median inflation adjusted, <laughs> not nominal, <laughs> cigarette cost per pack. As you can see, the median cigarette prices have seen periods of growth and stagnation. Um, between 1970 to mid-1980s, there was no growth in the um, uh, cost per pack. However, later we saw strong growth between um, mid-1980s to around 2008, and there was absolutely no growth in the cost <coughs> per pack between, uh, since 2010. Despite the interrupted growth in the cost per pack, in the cigarette cost per pack, there was actually decline in the consumption. And you can see that um, the continuous decline in the consumption since mid-1980s. However, in here, the consumption shows only for the tax cigarettes, so we don't have any way of measuring uh, consumption for the black market and um, uh, how much uh, consumption uh, is there for uh, people who avoid the taxes. So the following chart shows cumulative percentage change in inflation adjusted tobacco tax revenues since the recession for the last three recessions. So in other words, for example, the last recession started in December 2017. So the red line, which is for the last recession, shows the, the cumulative percentage change for the um, um, tax revenues from tobacco um, for the next eight years. And 
that's the case for the 2001 and 1990 recession. So you can see that this recession was different, despite the fact that we hit the, uh, the most severe recession in 2008, the tax revenues from tobacco didn't decline in the, in the start of the recession. Uh, actually, they showed growth. But the growth was mostly associated with the um, tax rate increases in the states. Whereas in the previous recessions, states have seen declines in, at the start of the recession, but then they showed uh, growth in the rest of the um, um, expansion period. In the last two years, actually, the tax revenues from tobacco have seen declines in um, inflation-adjusted terms. So I decided to divide the states into two groups, the states that had seen um, uh, tax rate increases between 2008 and 2016, which is in total um, of 32 states. And also the second group, the bottom line, is the states that did not raise the tax rates on the cigarettes. And when I looked at the tax revenues adjusted for inflation for uh, 2008, 2012, and 2016, you can see that between the 2008 and 2012, uh, for the nation as a whole, the tax revenues increased by 5.7%. However, the number of states that did not, the group of states that did not raise tax rates, they have seen, oops, they have seen 11.9% um, decline in tax revenues from tobacco, as opposed to the group of the states that uh, raised the taxes when they have seen 15.6% growth. So can someone explain to me why this happened? Why is it that the states um, with the tax rate changes have seen growth. What is the driver for the revenues to grow in the states? Uh, so the, you're going to have to answer the it. The tax on cigarette is an excise tax. Does everyone know what is excise tax and what are the different types of excise tax? So the excise tax can be two types, ad valerium or specific. Ad valerium, the term uh, comes, it's actually a Latin word and it actually means according to the value. When you have a good or service that is taxed on an ad valerium basis, when the revenues grow despite the uh, tax rate because um, the tax rate is on the uh, value of the item. In other words, let's say um, you have a service of haircut which is $100 and the tax rate is 10% in New York City when your tax uh, is going to be $10. But if the same haircut in Boston is $200, then you are going to pay $220, $20 tax. Whereas the specific rates are based on the uh, product, on the, um, on the, it's a, a fixed amount. So in other words, if the uh, tax in New York City on cigarette pack is $4 and the cost of the cigarette pack is two dollars when you are gonna pay six dollars but let's say you are buying a more expensive pack of cigarettes which cost six dollars you are still gonna pay four dollars additional tax so you are gonna pay ten dollars so that's the reason why the states that do not raise the tax rate on cigarettes end up losing money on uh, tax revenues from cigarettes so <coughs> When you look at the compound annual growth rate between 2008 and 2016, despite the fact that several states have increased the tax rate on cigarettes, you can still see that the tax rate, the tax revenues have seen on average 0.1% decline. That's in here. And the states that had increased the 
The tax rate have seen 1.1% growth, while the states with no tax rate increases have seen 2.5% decline. Now, let's move to alcohol. Um, alcohol taxation, just like the cigarette taxation, has a very long history. Anyone knows when was it first implemented in the United States? Right after the Constitution was adopted? The whiskey tax revolt in western Pennsylvania? Exactly. 1791, um, um, the U.S. Secretary of Treasury, uh, um, Alexander Hamilton, has introduced the whiskey tax. Any However, of you seen Hamilton? It's in there. It's in the, it's in the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but it went through some periods of um, abolishment of whiskey tax, abolishment of alcohol tax. For example, um, in 1817, alcohol tax was repealed. When, again, in response to the Civil War and the revenue crisis, the alcohol tax was reintroduced in 1862. Um, when we have the prohibition period between 1919 and 1931, 33, and when in 1933 we have the repeal of uh, prohibition in response to the Great Recession, and that's when alcohol tax in its modern um, um, structure became into existence. So it has a long history, and um, the states are uh, divided into two groups usually. There are about 33 states that regulate the alcohol industry through license systems and there are about 17 states that have a monopoly system of regulation. And the monopoly system of regulation is mostly for the uh, hard liquor and in some, in very few states also for wine. So um, depending on how the state regulates the alcohol industry, it can have different um, implications for the um, excise taxes, excise taxation of alcohol and uh, license fees. So <coughs> let's take a look at the tax rates. Just like in the case of tobacco, there is wide variation across the states in terms of the tax rates. The following uh, table divided into two columns shows the tax rates by type of alcohol and as well as by state. Usually states have much lower tax rate on beer uh, and much higher tax rate on distilled spirits. And um, um, for beer, uh, Wyoming has the lowest tax rate at 20 cents, whereas Tennessee has the highest tax rate at $1.29. In terms of beer, um, California has the lowest tax rate at 20 cents, and um, Alaska has the highest tax rate at $2.05 cents, and uh, there is wide variation across the states in terms of distilled spirits as well, with uh, Washington having the highest tax rate at nearly $15. And it's usually per gallon. Um, Do you want to share, well? Oh, no, I just know there's, the wine lobby is pretty strong in California. They give campaign contributions and sure. collections. I was wondering if that was why. Yeah. <laughs> and normally, unlike the tobacco taxes, states usually do not increase tax rates on alcohol. For example, I have it in here somewhere between, t since 2008, only six states. Connecticut, Illinois, New York, North Carolina, Rhode Island, and Tennessee have increased tax rates on beer. Um, the next slide shows, I don't know why it's, okay. <laughs> the next slide shows the um, 
It's the same figure as for the tobacco, but for alcohol, uh, it shows the tax revenues from uh, all types of alcoholic beverages since the start of the recession, um, for the last three recessions. You can see that unlike the previous, uh, unlike the 1990 recession, actually the tax revenues from alcohol increased. And despite the fact that states usually do not increase the tax rate on alcohol. And the reason is that when you look at the consumption data, I don't have it in here, but when you look at the consumption data, the consumption had gone up, way up in the last two decades. And that's the driver of the growth in the alcohol tax revenues. Um, so the state government alcohol tax and fee collections exceeded around uh, 7.2 billion in fiscal year 2016. But that 7.2 billion represents <coughs> only about 0.8% of state government tax revenues. Now let's move to gambling. So around 2018, we have seen this wave of states uh, legalizing casinos with Pennsylvania, Maryland, Ohio, and some other states, Massachusetts, New York, as well as states that already had exi uh, existing casinos and racinos, they have been expanding the number of casinos and racinos. And the question is, why do states legalize gambling and expand gambling when it's not necessarily viewed as a, a good social activity? Well, they do so to raise revenue in response to poor fiscal conditions, um, they do argue, supporters of um, gambling argue that it stimulates economic development, it counteracts interstate competition for gambling revenue, it attracts tourism, keeps uh, in-state gamblers, in-state uh, gambling residents in the state as well as the tax dollars in the state, and it, there is also some lobbying and some um, alignment of political interest in support of gambling. So since the Great Recession, two states have legalized lotteries in total, seven states have opened legalized casinos and opened casinos, and three states have legalized racinos. As a result, we have seen significant increase in tax and fee revenues from gambling in the states that have legalize the casinos and racinos and lottery. But at the same time, when you look at the tax revenues, and I'll so show you the, charge la uh, the charts later on, you will see that the tax and fee revenues in the states that had already adopted casinos and racinos pre-Great Recession have seen steep declines in um, revenues from casinos and racinos. So this expansion of gambling had created stiff interstate competition for the same pool of customers. This table shows simply the number of states with um, lottery casino, racino, premature and Indian casinos. You can see the expansion period um, before um, 1990s. The lotteries uh, were popular, uh, lotteries came into existence before 1990s, mostly in response to double deep recession in 1980s, whereas the casinos and racinos have expanded since um, in response to the last three recessions. So despite this um, growing number of states legalizing casinos and racinos, when you look at the big pie, the lot revenues from lottery still represent the most of the gambling revenues. So about two thirds of the total gambling revenue comes from lottery and uh, about 20% uh, comes from casino operations and um, the rest is from casinos, um, video gaming and parimutuel. And it's important to look at the parimutuel because once this parimutuel um, was the largest um, the most popular type of gambling, and it uh, used to generate lots of revenues, but today uh, they generate less than 0.5% uh, of the total revenues. 
and uh, this means that um, when you expand um, one type, when you legalize and introduce new type of gambling activity, it's usually at the cost of old type of gambling activities. So um, I'll talk about the sports betting a little bit later, but the um, states pushing for sports betting should worry about losing dollars from lottery. Now, the following chart shows the um, inflation adjusted state and local government gambling revenue between fiscal years 2008 and 2015. The blue line for various types of gambling activities. So the, this line, the uh, darker blue line is for lottery when we have the casinos, racinos, video games and parimutuals. And the red line is for the total gambling. So the only type of gambling excluded from this chart is the gambling revenue from Indian casinos. Indian tribes are not obliged to report data to the state, so it's really difficult to collect comprehensive data for Indian casinos. Um, and you can see when, uh, that in fiscal year 2008, the tax revenues from gambling were around $27.2 billion for the nation, whereas in, they grew only by half a billion by fiscal year 2015, despite the fact that there were lots of states legalizing casinos and racinos. What's the reason for the, um, uh, the reason is that when you expand gambling, you have, the pool of gamblers is only that big. You don't really necessarily bring in more customers into the market. So if you were traveling to Las Vegas previously, in the old days when there were no casinos outside of Vegas and Atlantic City to gamble, you no longer have the incentive to go to Nevada, you can stay in your state, Pennsylvania, and um, play in Pennsylvania. So the legalization of gambling doesn't, uh, and expansion of gambling doesn't really bring in more um, customers. The other thing is um, there is a shift, demographic shift that we are seeing, and um, we see that millennials don't really gamble as much as baby boomers do. And uh, with the baby boomers entering into, res uh, into retirement period and having less disposable income, also are reducing their uh, gambling habits and uh, gambling, uh, money spent on gambling. So this, go this is crucial as we get into whether to legalize sports gambling because the rationale for the lotteries was originally that this would divert money from the illegal gambling market into the legal gambling market. This is also the primary rationale for sports gambling is that there's an enormous amount of sports gambling going on illegally. So this will channel it into legal ways that we can tax. This char that chart suggests not true, right? Not true. Not true. And the other rationale for sports betting that <coughs> the supporters of sports betting, at least the industry, is trying to bring in millennials into the market. They are hoping that sports betting is going to attract more millennials into the market. Um, again, um, evidence, actually, I don't have it in here, but I do have longer term trends and the trends uh, you will see in lottery for lottery and casinos and casinos, you will see that what Greg said is absolutely true. Yes. Right, so, just, so this is total, this is total numbers, but for example, for a state that... For all states. For all states, yes. Pennsylvania will show growth. Right. But it's at the expense of New Jersey, which suffered a lot. Right, but that doesn't matter to Pennsylvania, because Pennsylvania is getting extra revenue. For a short period of time, until New York opened its own casinos. Oh, I see, I see. So then <laughs> there's a domino effect. Exactly. Yeah, so like Oklahoma can bet, but Texas can't. Yeah. So if we start allowing casinos in Texas, and we're just going to pull the people in South Oklahoma, they can come over. Yep. Theoretically, 
Yeah. I mean. You know, it says that people in Texas no longer have to go to Oklahoma. Yeah, Texas. Yeah, right, right, right. Texas no longer have to go to Oklahoma. Yes. So basically, you're saying that these ultimately end up competing with one another. They're not drawing in people off the yeah. two or three yeah. legs. Usually, and not only competing with each uh, between between the states, but also substituting. So, if you are legalizing sports betting, it's your discretionary amount. The people's discretionary amount is just that much. They cannot just go and do gambling casinos, buy lottery tickets, as well as do the sports betting. So, they are gonna have to choose, and there is a substitution where we are gonna spend that money. How many of you um, play the lottery? <laughs> no one. No one here raised their hand, and this is a group of virtually all millennials. So I guess that makes the point that we were making. I will say, I do know people that don't do lotteries. I do know millennials who do sports betting, which is more anecdotal, but... How many, are they men <coughs> or women? Uh, men. <laughs> men. And because Americans are into sports, and for sure the industry knows what they are doing, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, where was I? So, okay, just a quick timeline. The lottery timeline, it all started in the East Coast with uh, New Hampshire becoming the first state to legalize lottery operations, followed by New York in 1967. And... Um, you can see that the northeastern states were the early adopter states and the southern states were the late adopter states of the lottery. And overall, only six states don't have lottery operations. That is Alaska, Hawaii, Nevada, Utah, Mississippi, and Alabama. Here is the chart that I wanted, I, I was talking about. So in this chart, we show the year-over-year -year real growth rate in lottery revenues. Uh, from 1979 to 2017, that's the blue line. And the yellow line is the number of states legalizing lottery. So you can see that in 2017, we have 44 states that have lottery operations. And the growth started around mid-90s, the number of states growing. Um, so, and the black line, the dashed line is the linear trend line for the revenues from lottery. There was a strong growth in the start of the lottery operations because more and more states were legalizing lottery operations and it was less uh, competitive and people uh, lo uh, revenues were growing. And when we see this volatile period, but look at this period, mostly stagnant and large declines with the exception of the 2016 peak, which was only because of the jackpots being estimated at 1.5 billion, making the world's largest jackpot ever. So of course it created incentives to, uh, for more people to buy lottery uh, tickets, but uh, in a normal regular years, you see that lottery revenues have declined. Uh, in during the periods of recession, 2001 recession, 91 recession, as well as 2008 recession, which pr uh, proves the point that revenues from gambling activities are not recession proof. So lotteries are regulated or operated by state governments. The gross revenue from lottery is usually allocated among lottery administration, lottery prizes, and a portion of it goes to the state funds. And usually those are earmarked for specific programs. Most common um, program earmarked for is education, but also some states uh, support uh, use lottery revenues for environmental protection, for veterans programs, and uh, natural resources, etc. So you can see that most states transfer between 
uh, usually between 20 and 30 percent of the lottery revenues to the state funds. The exceptions are South Dakota and Oregon, and both of them um, transfer much significant share of the revenues to the state. South Dakota transfers around 74 percent, whereas Oregon transfers uh, 49 percent. So when you look at the compound annual growth rate for real uh, inflation adjusted lottery revenues between 2008 and 2015 by region, there is a large uh, discrepancy. You can see that the New England states have seen steep declines in terms of uh, lottery revenues for the fiscal year 2008 and 2015 period. And the only two regions that have seen some growth are Southwest and Southeast states. <coughs> For the nation as a whole, the compound annual growth rate was less than 0.1%. And in case you are interested in the state variation, here is the map showing the percent change in um, inflation adjusted revenues from lottery between 2008 and 2015. It had declined in total of uh, 21 states. Um, and um, in the median, the median state uh, growth was only uh, was negative 0.2 percent, whereas on average the growth was around 0.2 percent. I suppose everyone knows average and median, the distinction between average and median? Good. <coughs> so here is a quick timeline for casinos and racinos. Uh, I was able to track down the number of casinos in each state by year. The only two states that are excluded from these numbers are Nevada and South Dakota. Actually, it's good to exclude Nav Nevada because um, it's it was the early adopter state and um, it's an outlier and for South Dakota it doesn't have many casinos but um, it's impossible to get an accurate data for South Dakota. So you can see that before 1990 in the state in the whole nation outside of Nevada and uh, South Dakota there were only seven casinos in the nation. And, and seven casinos and racinos actually there. There were no racinos at the time, which represented around 3% of the modern uh, day number of casinos. In total, currently, actually as of fiscal year 2015, I haven't updated the numbers, but the number didn't change dramatically. The total number of casinos outside of Nevada and South Dakota uh, is 215. So in 1991, between 91 and 95, <coughs> overall total of 57 more uh, casinos and racinos were opened. <coughs> but most of the growth in the number of casinos and racinos was since fiscal year 2016, about 40% of all casinos and racinos outside of Nevada and South Dakota were opened in the last in, in 10 years period between fiscal year 2016, uh, 2006 and fiscal year 2015. And in case you are interested to see where are they located in the nation, here is the map of uh, showing the casinos and racinos. The uh, red dots are the dots for the casinos, the blue dots are the dots for racinos. In some cases they overlap. For example, in Colorado, you can see that there are 36 casinos, but because they are highly concentrated, so you see only two dots. This is a bit, um, um, uh, you have to be aware of this. So again, we don't show the number of <coughs> casinos for uh, Nevada and South Dakota, as well as for Massachusetts and New York, because they legalized uh, casino operations since fiscal year 2000. You can see that most of them are along the Mississippi River and usually states build casinos along the border lines of the states. Of course, with the idea of attracting uh, customers, uh, players from the neighboring states.
Okay. States have um, various tax rates on casinos. So some states have flat tax ta uh, rate and some states have graduated tax rate. Uh, in here, uh, you see, actually I went too far, yeah, commercial casino tax rates. So in here you can see that uh, the states are um, ranked by the legalization date. So you can see that the early adopter states usually have much lower tax rate on casinos, and on casinos, whereas the late adopter states have much higher tax rate. The two exceptions are Illinois and Indiana, and uh, that's only because the two states have um, legislative changes to increase the tax rate on casinos and casinos. So the tax rate can is uh, between three as low as 3.5% to 6.75% in uh, Nevada, whereas in uh, Maryland is as high as 67%. Large discrepancy between the tax rates for the nation. And in some states such as New York, um, the tax rate varies by facility. It can be as high as 45% uh, or as low as 37%. So there is also wide variation in terms of tax rates in, for casinos, but unlike the case of casinos, uh, there is no clear distinction between uh, tax rates for early adopter states and late adopter states. Um, the highest tax rate is again in Maryland around 67%. And again, some states have flat tax rates and other states such as, for example, New York has graduated tax rate. Now, which chart shows the year-over-year -year inflation adjusted growth rate for tax revenues from casinos and racinos between 1999 and 2015? Um, the, that's the blue line as well as the number of uh, states that have been legalizing um, no, it's the number of uh, casinos and casinos by year, not the number of states legalizing casinos and casinos, because there are states that have had casino operations, but they legalized casino operations at a later date. So I use the number of uh, facilities rather than number of states. You can see again that, back to the point that you were asking, uh, more and more casinos and casinos have been opening, whereas the revenue growth was downward. So the black line shows the uh, trend line, linear trend line for the casino and casino revenues. And uh, you can see that um, despite the growth rate, uh, casino and casino revenues have seen declines, uh, not only around the recession, but also in the in the most recent history, in fiscal year 2014, the revenues have seen declines. So in here, I show the cumulative percentage change in inflation adjusted casino and tax, uh, racino tax revenues since the fiscal year 2008, since the start of the Great Recession, and I divide the states into regions. So uh, you can see that uh, the only region that has seen really steep growth is the Northeast region, which is mostly caused by the opening of casinos and casinos in the state of um, Pennsylvania, but also Maryland, um, whereas the states uh, in the West and in the Midwest which did not have many states legalizing casino and casino operations, uh, didn't see growth. Actually, they have seen steep declines in casino and casino revenues. So the following figure shows exactly the same thing. The tax revenues from uh, casinos and casinos, but in here, uh, the blue line shows the growth since the Great Recession for all states that have casino and casino operations, which is about half of the states. And the yellow line excludes from the total only 
uh, four states, that is the Kansas, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Ohio. Please note that even Pennsylvania is included in here. So I excluded only those four states that had, did not have casino or casino operations at the start of fiscal year 2008. So when you do that, you can see that for the rest of the nation, the casino and casino revenues have seen steep declines. And the red line is all states, all casinos and casinos, with the exception of only one casino, that is the casino in New York City. So if you exclude just one facility from the national total, you see that the growth rate has been much weaker compared to the growth rate for all uh, states, uh, casino and casino revenues from all states. So in addition to commercial casinos and resorts, um, you have seen this chart that shows that the number of states do not actually have casinos or casinos. You can see that the western states and some of the southern states in here don't have casinos and casinos. But actually they do, it's just that they have it on Indian reservations. They have the Indian casinos and casinos. So in total, the number of states that don't have any type of casino, casino is only 10 states. Um, and um, <coughs> when the states push for the state commercial casinos and casinos, they also create a competition for the tribal casinos. When the states uh, uh, legalize casino and casino operation for commercial casinos and casinos, they actually create competition for the tribal casino for on so the Indian. Yes, of course, yeah. So I was able to collect good data for some se seven states, uh, for Indian casinos for, from some seven states. And just to give you an overview that the trend is still the same uh, for the nation as a whole between fiscal year 2008 and 2015, the um, total, uh, the subtotal for the seven states, the revenues declined by 4.6 percent, um, uh, um, declined by 0.6 percent in terms of compound annual growth rates and in terms of annual um, uh, growth rate between 2015 and 2008, it declined by 4 percent and most of the say, states have seen declines. Can you explain why California hasn't? Um, so it did not, but if you look at the actual <laughs> growth rate, it's only like $20 million more. So it's not really a strong growth. Um, so what we learn from here, when we look at the context of the gambling revenue from lottery, casinos and casinos, is that gambling is not recession proof, whereas um, Mm, many politicians like to argue that revenues from gambling is uh, sustainable and um, it brings in more money, but the uh, trends show that it has been seeing declines not only even during the recession, but also in other, uh, ec during the economic expansion times. And yes, gambling expansion brings in more revenue until a saturation point has reached. Some new revenue represents a shift rather than net growth. And um, we know for sure that future growth in gambling revenue will not keep up with, uh, with the pace of tax revenue, other types of tax revenue, that is income tax or sales tax, or with the growth rate in spending. The, if the revenues from gambling, for example, are earmarked for education purposes, the percent growth in education spending for the same period has been much higher than the percent growth in um, gambling revenue. So it's um, not a sustainable source of revenue and it's not a um, uh, solution for the never-ending quest to balance the budgets. 
still states are moving forward. The, a lot of states are energized and uh, about uh, many states, a dozen of states are introducing legislations for the sports betting. As you know, in May of last year already, 2018, the Supreme Court had uh, ruled over uh, sports betting and uh, the only state uh, that had sports betting at the time was Delaware, so um, several states uh, jumped and introduced sports betting. The tax rate varies uh, substantially between the states, as high as 51% in Rhode Island or as low as 6. Uh, well, 8.5% for New Jersey. Um, sports betting also uh, was in existence in uh, Nevada in some form. And some states are offering online gambling, um, so I looked at the numbers from New Jersey and in the first six months of its sports betting, uh, it raised about $8 million, um, 5 million of which came from online gaming rather than gaming at the facility was only $3 million. So, the state initially had estimated that it would raise about 30, $13 million in the first year of operations. So it's uh, already raised $8 million. For sure, they are going to raise the $30 million that they estimated. But it doesn't mean that the growth is going to continue and uh, it doesn't guarantee that uh, in the second year of operations, we will continue raising that much money, particularly that more states are gonna legalize sports betting and creating competition for each other. I don't have data from, a uh, good data from other states. The other f interesting part with the sports betting is the um, um, sport uh, leagues uh, such as NBA, NBA and um, Major League bas Baseball asking for their share as well. In other words, asking for the integrity fees. But no state had uh, agreed to uh, introduce integrity fees for the um, leagues. Meaning how much money they spent M for meaning how much tax revenue if that person was going to, you know, engage just in one of these things, like have they figured out which is <coughs> the state, as if this person was just to do sports betting rather than go into a casino as a normal for that. Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know, but you should ask the the people who come tomorrow and Thursday. So what you were talking about, like if, if there was a Mm -hmm. what is that change? Yeah. yeah, I think it also depends at the time. For example, at the time when you have a high jackpot, estimated jackpot, probably there is going to be a variation how much the person is valuable for the lottery versus for sports betting. Yeah. The New Jersey state budget in 2016 was $60 billion. Right. Anybody want to figure out the percentage yeah. the 13 million of 13 for the, million to yeah. 60 billion dollars? I don't think we have enough decimal points. <laughs> I have a chart later okay. on on that. <laughs> so, despite this fever, despite the fact that a lot of states are going to continue introducing sports betting in the coming years, I believe sports betting will not be a budget solver for the states. Um, it will definitely generate some revenue in the short run, just like New Jersey. The history shows that the growth in revenues from expanded gambling quickly deteriorates and declines in some cases. Um, so there were two studies done, uh, there was a study done by Oxford Economics Group saying that they forecast that the sports betting will bring about $3. billion in uh, to state and local government revenues. And that 
4 billion dollar translates into less than 1.5 percent of total state and local government on source revenues so in other words even if your forecasts are correct even if you bring double of that money seven billion dollar it will still be less than five percent of the total state and local government tax revenue and um, uh, is with the prudent uh, fiscal policy i don't know i well i mean definitely not <laughs> But you suggest <laughs> your your bottom line here is that the three point four billion is probably not true, probably too high, <coughs> and even if it is true, it's going to come at the expense of mostly other gambling. Mostly other gambling. And this and this figure has appeared in virtually every story I've ever seen about sports gambling, including one I wrote. So, so yeah, and they say it will generate about twenty four uh, twenty two point four billion dollars contribution to GDP, but that represents less than 0.1% of overall GDP. And not to mention that <coughs> it's one thing to count the revenues, but to count actually the cost of it is the so uh, soft cost of it, the social cost, how much money um, government spent on problem gambling, etc that's really hard to uh, calculate and uh, it comes with a big social cost as well, of course. Of course, yeah. So does this mean that interest in sports betting, especially from millennials, is not going to be high? That they're not interested in doing, in doing sports betting? Um, I <coughs> cannot speak about from the millennial perspective, but I know that the, from the government perspective, it shouldn't be, um, um, they shouldn't be looking into sports betting as a revenue solution. I mean, millennials, you look like a millennial, I would you know, have I a? Know, <laughs> but I mean, I feel like I, I hear about it all the time, and it's so, I mean, interesting. So I'm, I, maybe that's another question for when we do our I'm sure many? that's a question we should deal with tomorrow, absolutely. How many of you have considered um, getting engaged into sports betting? <laughs> every wait, I, I buy a box on a Super Bowl thing every when I can. <laughs> you do. Like one, like one game. One game. Um, I mean, I understand the whole thing that people like sports, and probably it makes sense that they do the office pools and they might engage in uh, if they can make money, they might engage. But at the same time, you know the. Environment changes so fast. People change their spending preferences. Like in the old days, people wouldn't travel as much as they are traveling now. And I think that even with the love for sports, more people would prefer spending that money on other activities rather than on um, sports betting. And you know that at the end of the day, the chance of winning is low. I mean, <laughs> why will you engage in the activity? So, but I mean, I don't know what's going to be the market for the sports betting. I guess like the, the ease of enter play into it at all though, because some of the sports betting is so easy. It's either you're choosing this, this group who win by 20 or not win by 20 <coughs> or, you know, what have you. So it's easy, I think, for people to understand. Do you think it's easy to understand? I don't think sports gambling is easy to understand. Some, some type. I can barely read. So the, the sports media sites have, are, people think they're going to be, have a bonanza because readership is going to soar. And if you look at ESPN or if you look at the New York Post sports page, now every day there are gambling oriented stories. What's the best bet for the national championship game? But it's not who's going to win. It's what's the over-under on this? What's the over-under on this? And also the idea is, is that people will gamble um, at the end of the <laughs> first quarter, will Alabama score more points than Clemson in the rest of the game? So I don't think there's ease of entry at all. But again, we'll go into more depth on this tomorrow. I would say ease of play, like if more states legalize online, perhaps that will make it. Perhaps. Now remember, online legalization today means you must physically be in the state. 
You cannot gamble in New Jersey from here. You but would have to, you'd have to go through the tunnel and gamble on the other I'm side. I'm not sure if that is hackable or not, just like people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I was, I'm trying to hack MSG. I don't know. I'm trying to hack MSG because I cut the cord and it's not available on streaming. And so far, I have not been successful. But I'm not a millennial, so maybe I just don't have the skills. All right, so we need to move on to marijuana. Or so marijuana. Um, so... I'm Canadian. Canada became the second state, <laughs> the second country in the world to legalize <laughs> marijuana legally nationwide at the federal level. But let's look at the states. So, on just like mar uh, alcohol and tobacco, marijuana has a long history. Uh, in 1911, you have the prohibition period when you have the decriminalization period starting in 1973. Actually, Oregon became the first state to decriminalize the marijuana. Then you have the period starting 1996 where states uh, started legalizing medical marijuana. Uh, California was the first state in uh, 1996. And then you have the recreational legalization starting 2012 with Colorado and Washington becoming the first two states to legalize uh, marijuana for adult use for uh, recreational purposes. So here you have the legalization date and the start date. As of now, there are um, 10 states and DC where marijuana uh, is legal for adult use for recreational purposes. <coughs> um, Again, there have been some forecasts done in terms of how much revenue states are expected to generate from marijuana. One of the studies by the Tax Foundation estimated that potential tax revenue for each state based on sales per capita observed in Colorado and Washington, which is not quite accurate because, of course, those were the two early adopter states and they had higher per capita sales. But still, let's say, um, the sales are going to be the same per capita as in Colorado and Washington. The Tax Foundation has estimated that marijuana could generate around $5.3 billion for state and local governments if it's taxed at 15% rate, and it can generate up to $8.8 .8 billion if it's taxed at 25% rate. Then there is another study done by Divya Raghavan who estimated that um, potential tax revenue for each state based on the number of current marijuana smokers age 25 and higher and such uh, information is uh, available through SAMSHA. So she also estimated that uh, the tax revenues are going to be around $3 billion if they are taxed at 15% tax rate. So much lower compared to $5.3 billion. And she also factored in not only the 15% excise tax rate, but also the additional state sales tax rates because you have the excise tax rate on marijuana as well as your regular state sales tax rate. Still $3.1 billion, you already know what does it mean for the state budgets. Um, in the following few charts, I just uh, quickly show the tax rates and the tax revenues for each state, for the, uh, for the five states that had uh, marijuana um, until the end of fiscal year 2018, I guess. So the regulation, I'm sure we are going to talk about it later, but it went through steep uh, learning curves. States have been introducing um, uh, ad valerium type of tax or specific tax. So they have been going back and forth in terms of how much should they tax on marijuana, should they tax medical marijuana or not, because usually prescription drugs 
in the most states are not taxed, but do we have to tax uh, medical marijuana for prescription purposes or not? So for example, in Colorado, the tax is 2.9% on medical marijuana, and uh, as of July 2000, uh, 2017, uh, it's 15% for recreational marijuana. <coughs> and just for comparison purposes, the tobacco tax rate in Colorado is 84 cents, and the state sales tax rate is 2.9%. Now, the following chart shows the uh, revenues from recreational versus medical marijuana. Uh, you can see that the revenues from medical marijuana didn't really see growth, much growth. They have been steady around less than $2 million per year uh, 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 over the period between February 14 to November, uh, February of 2014 to November 2018. Uh, so since the start of the, since the inception of marijuana, the state in total had uh, uh, generated around $787 million in recreational marijuana which is for the spam of 80, uh, 58 months. Uh, another state, Alaska, uh, the effective, again, they changed the taxation of the marijuana effective uh, to uh, January 1, 2019. Sales and transfers of marijuana are subject to new tax rates. Um, those are the tax rates. Uh, based on quantity, $50 per ounce. And it has a high tax rate on tobacco, but the state doesn't have sales tax. And when you look at the um, revenues from uh, marijuana in Alaska, since the inception, which is November 2016, it has seen some growth for sure, And but Overall, in the span of 25 months, the state has generated $17.8 million in recreational marijuana. I'll put those numbers in perspective in a second, in a minute. Um, another state marijuana tax rates in Oregon is about 17%. Again, they have changed the st structure of the tax. Before January 1st, 2017, they were taxing based on um, quantity, $35 per ounce, but uh, they changed the tax structure and uh, now they are taxing on ad valorem basis uh, based on the value. The PAGO tax rate is around uh, $1.33 and again, the state doesn't have uh, sales tax. Um, for Oregon, it was difficult to track revenues from since the inception. Um, and so I don't have the revenues from the start of the uh, marijuana um, sales, but I do have data starting February 2016 until November 2018. And funny enough, these numbers include not only the tax revenues for marijuana itself, but also any other goods that are sold in the store. Like if you are buying a t-shirt with a marijuana leaf or whatever in the store, that's what the state contact told me that um, we cannot separate the revenues for marijuana only. We include everything. So between uh, February 2016 and November 2018, um, the revenues for marijuana totaled $260 million. Next, the marijuana tax rates in uh, Washington are pretty high. The excess tax rate is at 37%, uh, but the tobacco tax rate is also super high at $3.25. The state sales tax is at 6.5%. And um, yeah, one important thing to note is that um, in addition to state tax rates, localities can also impose the tax. For example, in uh, Washington state, it ranges between uh, 05 to 3.1%. And in addition, they also have the business and occupation gross receipts tax for marijuana. Uh, 
I don't have monthly data for marijuana in uh, Washington state. We just report the numbers by year and you can see that in fiscal year 2015, the, they generated $66 million and by fiscal year 2018 they generated $367 million. So they generated around close to $1 billion between 2015 and 2018. <coughs> Nevada, the tax rate is 15% at whole size and 10% at retail. Um, the state uh, tobacco tax rate is $1.80 and the state sales tax rate is $6.85. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, the revenues didn't see steep growth. I mean, it still doubled between July 2017 and October 2018. And I think one of the reasons is people either gamble or <laughs> get high. <laughs> That's why, unlike the other states, when you see this steep growth in tax revenues, I mean, if you compare to Colorado or other states, it's not as steep. I mean, yeah, it doubled, but not didn't triple or... Uh, grew that much and I think that's the only explanation that I can, hypothetical explanation that I can give. Um, the tax rates in uh, California just recently introduced uh, marijuana is again um, uh, changing the tax rate as of February, uh, January 1st, 2020. Um, the bottom line of this different tax rate is that states are still learning how much they should tax the industry, whether they should tax on ad valorem basis or on specific um, excise tax. And um, if you look at all, 50 st uh, of, uh, all five states for fiscal year 2018, the five states in aggregate generated $770 million. So Alaska generated $9 million, which is only 0.6% of the um, state um, on source general revenue. And uh, in Nevada, the state um, raised $70 million, only 0.7% of the general on source state government revenue. So you can see that uh, the highest is Colorado, and it makes sense because it's an early adopter state, and uh, it actually, uh, it's not by chance that around the nation, the state that has seen the steepest growth in population is Colorado, and it kind of coincides with the marijuana legalization period. So some people actually moved, relocated to Colorado because of marijuana legalization. But you cannot really expect that marijuana tax revenue will generate, will be around this percentage of. That's true, but I, what the takeaway I've got is that <coughs> while there are complications, marijuana has more potential than sports gambling. Is that a fair assumption? Uh, your numbers are bigger. The numbers are bigger. Yeah. Okay. Try to get this devil's advocate if I'm a government official. Yeah, that's only generating 1.7% of my total revenue, but it's also $245 million I didn't have yesterday. Yeah. True. And the budget director from one of the states, which I'm not going to mention, was always telling me that, yes, I understand it's not a lot of money, but each single million dollar counts for the state. When you are running on deficit, each single million dollar counts. But isn't it the time to look into um, revising the tax structures for the state governments? Like, for example, income tax is supposed to be progressive, but in some states it's effectively a flat rate because the states have not adjusted the rates into inflation. I mean. I think Michigan is one of the examples when you have essentially a flat tax rate. Yeah. What I wonder, like, I do agree, like, $280 million is better than no $280 million, but that's the revenue side of the income statement. But what are the expenses that the government incurs 
Exactly. That minus costs. So you always want me to bring it back to the journalism issue. Yes. So let me point out the journalism. <laughs> so I'm doing these three sessions at the request of the Associated Press, which has made this a major effort for the coming year on the state and local front. I'm about to have a drink in half an hour with the former head of the Citizens Budget Commission in New York, just retired. And I told her that, and her response to me was, you've got to be kidding. What? You've got to be kidding. It's not worth it. it. It's not. It's sports gambling and weed are not worth that kind of effort oh. because it has such limited impact. So those are the twin journalistic poles. So in this case, and this is a learning experience for me too, will the journalistic effort on this be worth the opportunity cost? Everybody knows what opportunity cost is? All those AP reporters could be doing something else. So anyway, that's the journalistic question. Yes. But people really like to read stories about weed. That's yeah. possibly, no. the, and I'm, that's part of the equation too. But anyway, I afraid that's the, this session represents the journalistic question of how much, this is a story, and is this the place <coughs> to put it? And at least my, one of my wise people, told me in my response, are you kidding? So anyway, that's just framing it. Can I just make one more point? Yes. Okay, so uh, a reporter told me once that the legalization of marijuana is not about the financial advantages and the business and all that treating it like cigarettes. It's a public policy issue about prisons. That's pi and that's, that's a good- That's the decriminalization. Decriminalization <laughs> of thousands of people in prisons. But but that, her point is that's not the same thing. 100 agree, but that's not legalization. Decriminalization, as uh, you know, I showed you in the beginning, the period starting in 1996. But it could still be in the legal, you know, stuff? Like, like in D.C. How can you be in prison for something that's legal? Anyway, let's, let's defer that for Thursday, because that's on the agenda for Thursday. Because we, 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 we are at an hour and 15 minutes, so and we should wrap know, this up. As is the case of the sports betting, when you are legalizing marijuana, I mean, I have no, actually, to be perfectly honest, I personally don't have any decided stand on that, but I know that people who are gonna turn into marijuana, they are gonna give up cigarettes. You cannot be smoking both. And um, so, which means that, and people who don't smoke, they are not gonna smoke, neither cigarettes nor marijuana, which means- No, but I will eat the candies, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> especially, if Maybe. They help, especially if they help me go to sleep, but so far, but so far my tests are, uh, are not good on that subject. <laughs> but it's gonna be at the expense of revenues from tobacco. I bet it's gonna be a substitution for tobacco revenue. Isn't that like a good thing? Like revenue-wise, <laughs> well, this way you can that, that's for that's for later in the week. This is the revenue session. <laughs> this is the revenue implication session. I mean, the bottom line is that <laughs> marijuana taxation, as you can see from the historic perspective, is rather complicating, and the states are still gaining experience as they move forward. And um, in most states. Whereas in the beginning they were taxing on, a, um, ad, uh, on uh, they had like specific excess tax based on the quantity. So, uh, states are moving to the direction of having a ad valorem tax on it, so which normally means it has automatic growth potential as prices rise, unlike the case of tobacco tax revenues, tobacco tax structure. Um, states should 
be very careful when they are forecasting marijuana tax revenues, particularly as more and more states are legalizing marijuana and comp uh, um, creating competition for the states. Um, and the spread of marijuana legalization means that the tourism demand for marijuana will definitely decline, while the in-state consumption would go up. Um, and states should also worry about the tax structure, the tax rates, particularly with the, in compa comparison to border states, because we know that if they have highly uh, very tax structures, it will create a tax evasion incentives for the um, for the users of marijuana. Yep. I was wondering if you if, if you thought that this might be more sensitive to like tax evasion in in the states because there's already like a large. I feel like these there's like a there seems like there's a, a big market for marijuana without like the state. I, I guess maybe compared to like alcohol consumption, it's not like you can go buy alcohol from like a guy. Or you could, like, Well, isn't it the same? The same issue is this: it will take all this underground money and move it into the main economy. So let's test that out when we get to Thursday. I believe you still cannot bring marijuana to the state. I mean, at least legally, if you are traveling to Colorado, you have to buy it in Colorado. You have to consume in Colorado. You cannot. Right, but we are legalizing yeah. it. We are going to legalize it in New York because we're going to be surrounded by New Jersey, uh, Vermont, and Massachusetts, all of which where mm -hmm. it will be legal and there'll be lots of, the, the theory is lots of people going. Let's uh, get to the last slide. So the last slide is putting everything in context. So you have the tax revenues from lottery, casino, casino video games, parimutuel, subtotal, subtotal of gambling for fiscal year 2008 and 2015. You have the same tax revenues for alcohol, tobacco, and um, what I call the subtotal of all sin taxes. So in 2008, the tax revenues from alcohol, tobacco, and gambling was $46.3 billion, and it grew by um, to $52.4 billion. But what's important to note in here is the tax revenues from different types of uh, activities, sin taxes, as a share of state and local government tax revenues. So in overall, they represented around 3.48% in 2008, but the share of tax revenues from sin taxes uh, declined to 3.35%, despite all the growth, all the legalization of gambling and tax rate increases on tobacco and increase in alcohol consumption. So you can see that that is also the case for the uh, alcohol, uh, um, tobacco, alcohol not, but uh, for the gambling as well, the gambling represented around 1.84 percent of the total state and local government tax revenues, but the share declined to 1.77 percent. So if you add the marijuana and sports gambling into here, you cannot expect this to be more than 5 percent. I mean, at most 5 percent of the state and local government tax revenues. Thank you very much. Thank you.